Good morning, everybody. For those of y'all that don't know me, my name is Danik Coffey. I'm one of the pastors here, one of the elders as well. I'm just going to pray us in this morning. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time that you've given us, God. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you're the God of miracles, God. You're a God that's faithful, Lord. You're not one that abandons your people. You're not one that leaves us alone and destitute, God. God, you're always present, present with us, God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that's already here with us today. And I just ask, Lord, today that you would use me as a vessel to speak what you want to speak. I give you my words, Lord. I give you this time. And I just give you your way today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This has been the most, um, most interesting time preparing this message this week. It's been a, a journey. I think the Lord gave me the word for this message during our worship night on Friday of last week. I was kind of like, Lord, what do you want to say? And he just spoke the word to me. He said this phrase. He said, I'm in the fire. I'm like, okay, Lord. I don't know that I don't know where that's coming from, but I knew we were, I knew what he wanted to talk about today. And I don't know. The Lord just has me to sit down kind of like I'm sitting at a desk right now. So this is where I'm at. Why don't you open your Bibles today? We're going to look in the book of Daniel. And I want to read a lot of verses today. I'm going to tell a couple of Bible stories. Y'all know me. I like the Bible. <laughs> Eileen, good job. And I guess before we go in, we get in. You know, we, if you look, if you walked with us for a long time, you know that we called our journey from the woods to here, crossing over the Jordan, kind of paralleling to the Israelites crossing from the wilderness into their promised land. And sometimes I still, I feel like we're still crossing the Jordan as a ministry here. But um, once, once the Lord took them into the promised land and they crossed over the Jordan, the Lord had them do what? They fought some battles. They, the promised land was there. It was being given to them, but they had to fight for it. And just like what the elders brought this morning, there's a little bit of a fight that's being presented to us as a body, whether it's financial or through prayer or whatever. There's some fighting that we have to do in order to, to get what God has promised us. He's going to help us. And that's what we'll talk about today. So if you open your Bible to Daniel chapter 2, we're going to look starting in verse 1. And I'm not going to read all of the verses today because there's a lot of verses in these chapters. We don't have time. If you want to know the full story, go back and read on your own time. <clears throat> Hopefully y'all are doing that anyway. Daniel chapter 2 verse 1, it says... In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams by which the spirit, by which his spirit was troubled and agitated, and his sleep went from him. Then the king commanded to call all the magicians, enchanters, soothsayers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, diviners, to tell the king his dreams. So the king stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans, diviners, said to the king in Aramaic, the Syrian language, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. Then the king answered the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me, and the decree goes forth from me, and I say it with all emph emphasis, if you do not make known the dream to me with its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Now, if we were to put some of this into present-day language, there would probably be some expletives in there. 
basically, Israel's in captivity to an evil king, Nebuchadnezzar, and he has a dream that's really bothered him. And he calls in, like, the witches and the warlocks and the tarot card readers and the crystal ball folks, whatever they're called. And he says, I want you to tell me the dream that I had, and I want you to interpret for me. And they say, well, tell us the dream, and we'll interpret it for you. He says, I don't remember the dream. I want you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And um, they continue to ask him, like, well, we, we need you to tell us the dream in order to interpret it for you. And so he was angry. You'll see, he's, he's not the nicest king in the Bible. Let's go to verse 9. It says, if you will not make known to me the dream, this is Nebuchadnezzar, there is but one sentence for you, for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me, hoping to delay your execution until the time is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can tell me the interpretation of it. So remember, he's, if they don't do this, he's going to kill them. The Chaldeans, diviners, answered before the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can show you this matter, for no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician nor enchanter or Chaldean. A rare and weighty thing, indeed, the king requires. Nothing except the gods can reveal it to the king, and their dwelling is not human flesh. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So basically, they go on to almost like mock King Nebuchadnezzar, like, you're asking an impossible task. Nobody's ever asked for this to be done before, and this can't be done. And so that takes him off even further, and now he wants them all to be killed. Verse 13. So the decree went forth that the wise men were to be killed, and the officers sought Daniel, who wrote this book, and his companions to be slain. Then Daniel returned an answer which was full of prudence and wisdom to Arioch, the captain or executioner of the king's guard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so urgent and hasty from the king? Then Arioch explained the matter to Daniel. And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would set a date and give him time and he would show the interpretation. So here's Daniel, minding his own business. He is one of the wise men in Babylon. And he hears a knock on the door. He opens it up and it's the executioner in the king's army. And he says, hello. And the executioner says, are you Daniel? And he says, yes, I am. And the executioner says, I'm here to kill you. And he has no idea what's going on. He, Daniel, in his wisdom, asks, why do you want to kill me? Like, what's, what's up? And um, he tells him the situation. And he tells the executioner, yes, I'll, I'll fulfill the request that the king has made. I will tell him the dream and the interpretation. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, so that they would desire and request mercy of God, the mercy of God of heaven, concerning this secret that Daniel and his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel had some brothers. Who has brothers or sisters in this house? Not biological brothers and sisters. Real brothers and sisters that whenever something crazy comes out of the left field, that you are able to run to them and have them pray and believe and agree with you to link arms with you. Who has those kinds of brothers and sisters in the house? About half of the people in the room. I want to invite you. We have a lot of people that are those kinds of people here in this house. We have lots of communities that you can engage in to, to find that type of, of strength and support. Because we all have those types of situations that happen. 
So Daniel had brothers. And not only did he have brothers, he had brothers with names that were prophetic. And I want y'all to keep the meanings of these names in y'all's mind today, if you can pull them up, Josh. There you go. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Hananiah's name means grace, mercy, gift of the Lord. Mishael means who is like God, and Azariah means helped by God. One second. Got to find back where I'm at my, in my notes. There we are. So he goes to his brothers and he says, there's this crazy thing. We're all about to get killed. And the only way out of this is that we ask God to reveal to us the dream that the king had and the interpretation. And so his brothers say, all right, we're going to go to prayer. Just kind of like what Steve was challenging us today. Like, we have, a, we have an issue as a body that, that we all need to link arms and we need to go to the Lord and ask for the solution. And basically, Daniel goes off and prays and what does the Lord do? He shows him the dream. It was very detailed. I'm not going through that today again. If you want to know exactly what all that is, go back and read it for yourself. Um, and then the Lord, of course, gives him the interpretation as well. And Daniel's immediate response whenever the Lord reveals the unrevealable, is to praise and worship the Lord. There's a whole section, like six or seven verses, where he's just worshiping God for what, for what he had done. Let's go ahead and jump to verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and thus said to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation of his dream. Verse 26, And then the king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known the dream to me which I have seen and the interpretation of it? So, Daniel's name means God is my judge. And the Babylonians had given, a, given him a different name, Belteshazzar, which um, is after their god, their false god. I, found, I couldn't find like one conclusive meaning of his name, but an interesting name that I found, uh, or meaning of the name that I found was Lady Save the King. So they, Lady Save the King, yes, Barbara. So they, they gave him a name that was, had nothing to do with who he was and who God had called him to be. Hmm. The Lord says there's, there's many Belteshazzars in our culture today. Many who the culture has called them other than who they are known to the Lord by. And the Lord's looking for a people who are willing to stand in the gap between these Belteshazzars and the Lord and open the eyes, open the eyes of these, these men and women to reveal the unrevealable to them, to reveal the character, the heart, the presence of God to them. Hmm. Will you be one of those today? Verse 27 says, Daniel answered the king, the mysterious secret which the king has demanded, neither the wise men, enchanters, magicians, nor astrologers can show the king. But there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king, to King Nebuchadnezzar, what it is that shall be in the latter days at the end of days. 
So again, Daniel goes on to give the dream and the interpretation, revealing that there is a God who can re reveal the unrevealable. So the witches and warlocks and satanic people said, this is not possible. Only, only the gods could reveal this to you, and they do not inhabit mere men. Well, the one true God did. He inhabited Daniel and did everything that the false gods and the false demonic people said that was impossible. And in response, King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 46 said, or he fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel as a great prophet of the highest God and ordered that an offering and incense should be offered up, up to him in honor of his God. Then the king answered Daniel, of a truth, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secret mysteries. Seeing that you could reveal this secret mystery, then the king made Daniel great and gave him many great gifts. And he made him to rule over the whole province of Babylon and to be the chief governor over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel requested of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the gate of the king at the king's court. Josh, I found it. You can have it ready. You don't have to put it up in. So death, Daniel's uh, death sentence became his promotion. There was sometimes we can we can be minding our own business, doing what we think is right. Mm. And the, and the enemy sends an attack for you to destroy you. And it will destroy you if you don't have a true faith and understanding who God is that you serve. Can somebody today say that my death sentence is my promotion? Seriously, can we say that today? My death sentence is my promotion. Like I'm really serious, you can pull it up. Yeah, there you go. We need to declare that over ourselves today as this house that what looks like a death sentence to us is actually our promotion because there's always been a death sentence on Christians. There's always been a death sentence on the church of Jesus. Always. It's nothing new. But whenever, whenever we find ourselves in situations where there is a death sentence upon us, we have two options. We can just give up and die, let that, let that come to pass, or we can stand on the truth that's been spoken over us. We can stand on the promises that the Lord has given us. We can stand in the prophetic words that the Lord has spoken and we can war with the truth that God has given us and stand on the faith of who he says he is. Check, check. But we can't, just, we can't just know who he said that he is. We need to know for ourselves who he says that he is. Not, from, not just because the Bible says it. Sometimes we do, need to, we do need to discipline ourselves to believe it just because it's what's in the Word, but we need to allow for our experience and our encounter from our own lives when we find ourselves in these difficult situations to become the manifest truth within us that whenever a death sentence comes against us, there's not a question in my mind like, oh, Lord, are you good? Like, are you going to let this happen? Or are we really going to die in this moment? Like, 
if that's where your mind's at, you're losing the battle. I know what Pastor E said earlier today, but if you don't already know in your heart that the Lord is good and that he is for your victory and for your success and the things that he's called you to, you're losing. So from a conversation with the executioner knocking on the door to then being appointed directly to work in the court of the king. My death sentence is my promotion. Your death sentence is your promotion because your death sentence, the impossible situation, is the opportunity for God to finally reveal the glory of who he is in your life. We live in such manners that everything is so controlled. I was so convicted. We had a, we had a meeting this week with uh, our worship council, and my sister Angie said something that was really good, and it really stuck with me all week. So I'm going to steal it, Angie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it right now. But she said, because we were, I'm going to be honest, so there's times where in this house you can really feel the presence of the Lord moving really strong, and we, as the people that oversee our front end of the service, the worship time, we asked, we asked everyone, we said, is there anything that hinders the Spirit of God during our worship time? Everybody was exactly like you. There's a couple of people who are like, and everybody's like, I don't want to offend anyone. And I'm, I want to hear the truth. Like, I know what I see. I know what I feel. I know what's happening. And finally, they all say yes. And they were very respectful about it. We have amazing people in that group. And so we can continue to let the Spirit of God be hindered in our body. Who wants that? Put your hand down. He's just wanting to respond. Little kid. Nobody wants that. Like, if that's what we want, then why did we even show up to church? There's no reason to be here. There's plenty of other places and environments you can be where everybody is controlling everything and God doesn't have a place to move and do what he wants to do. So why come here? Why? So I ask this group and I say, I say, is that happening? And Angie, is it okay if I share this? I'll, it wasn't mean. It was with the right heart. It was great. And it really ministered to me. I didn't ask her about this before the message. I just, it came to mind, and the Lord's speaking to me is still in it right now. She said, well, you know, we have a lot of structure. And I'm paraphrasing. This is not exact word for word. We have a lot of structure, and, you know, there's situations where we'll have, like, everything scheduled to the minute. And she said, I just like to have time where, yeah, we have time in the schedule for Lord. If you want to do something else, then you can do that. And so I was, even as I, was, as I was praying over my message this week, I was like, man, the Lord was really convicting me. Like, yeah, Danik, you know, whenever you, whenever you prepare your messages, like, it's, you've timed it exactly minute by minute just to, to get all of that information that I've put in your heart there, but you've left no room for if I want to do something else. This is one of those something else moments. This is not in my message at all. And this week as I was praying, I, I, I went through my message. I'm like, oh, it's going to be like 30 or 35 or 40 minutes. I have like some extra time. So, all right, Lord, maybe that's from you or thank you for helping me learn how to create a space for you. Hmm. And recently I've been telling the, telling the staff and working with them and the different leaders in the house, like, we have a structure, we have a plan. But that's just like the baseline. Like, this is the Lord's house. He's given us the structure, he's given us the plan. But who thinks that the Lord likes us to the, do the same thing all the time, every week, pray the same prayers, 
sing the same songs, have the same order of service, like, is that what the Lord wants? I, I think in the Lord's presence in his kingdom, there's probably a lot more excitement even though what we see in our own times together. That's, that's what my heart is wanting to see. I believe that's what a lot of your heart is wanting to see. But whenever it comes to us being here together as the body, we find ourselves very stuck in doing the same things that we always do. Why is that? I don't know. I'm, I'm asking, and it's the, the question just came to my mind, so I don't even have an answer for myself. <laughs> Why do we do that? Afraid? Yeah, somebody said fear. Maybe, maybe we're afraid of what other people are going to think. What's somebody going to think about me if I like go run up to the altar and I like lay face down on the ground or I dance around like David did? Like, please. Unless the, really the Spirit of the Lord has told you to run around in your pajamas or your underwear, like, there could be somebody that prophetically the Lord would tell to do that, but definitely come to one of the elders of the house or the pastors of the house before you do that. Let's, we want to agree with you. We want to bless it. We don't want it to be a snare to us as a body. But, but how do we get there? Like, how all of our heart is wanting to be there. And we live in a, in a culture, in a society, in a region where people, they feel obligated to stand still, raise my hand for a little bit, sit down, be quiet. Even in our house sometimes, whenever, whenever we like are asking for some agreement from y'all and like wanting y'all to, even that prophetic statement, that de declaration that I just gave y'all, like two people said it. And I'm not, I'm not like jabbing at y'all, but that's, that's a promise that the Lord wants to give you today. And only two people received it in the house. I'm gonna pick on somebody. Who can I pick on? Jay, I wanna pick on you today. Can I pick on you? <laughs> he said no I, I want to I share I gave Jay a prophetic word a couple weeks ago and I love Jay he just carries like this peace and this calm about him he's very steady and there's a lot of strength in who you are Jay and I just I appreciate you they're newer to the house and I love them um, but what, when I was praying over him the Lord showed me that there's this like bubbling of joy like overflowing out of him i said jay you need to share that with me you need to share that with some other people how, how are you going to do that and so i'm this is the hypo hypothetical theoretical thing don't feel any obligation jay what i'm about to say but what if jay came up here and he was like doing cartwheels and like <laughs> dancing unabashedly at the altar like who is going to be disapproving of that in the house no one wow so if any of you were to come up here and just crazily worship the lord no not caring what anyone else thinks would that be offensive to anyone so pastor mandy says as long as it was of the lord i agree i agree sometimes there are people that manifest things and it it's disguised as being worship or, or giving glory to the Lord, but it's actually not. It's trying to bring, bring glory to yourself, and that is not of the Lord. But what, what the Lord's having me to speak to right now is that, and I, I talked about the religious and orphan spirit in the last message that I had. If you hadn't heard that, go listen to it too. But the Lord wants there to be freedom in this house. He wants there to be freedom in his house. So if he wants it and he's given it do we want to receive it yes amen five people want to receive it if you want to receive stand up right now if you want to receive it i'm way off the page i don't even know how i'm going to get back to where i was at as, as long as I'm on the Lord's page. 
right now, the Lord is speaking over you. He says, I want you to have freedom, refuge. I want you to have freedom to worship. I want you to have freedom to see people delivered. I want to see you have the freedom to lay hands on people for them to be healed. I don't care what's happening in the moment. He says, I want my spirit to be poured out in every moment over every instance and situation in this house during your service times, outside of your service times, in your small group communities, in the women's communities, the men's communities, the youth collective and prayer culture, and every opportunity that you have to engage with its body, the Lord says, I want freedom right there. And the Lord says, and he calls to you right now, he says, will you receive it? Say, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Look to your neighbor and say, I receive it. All right, you can be seated. Well, sounds like we have a little more agreement in the house. So, Daniel's brothers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he did not forget about them. He was promoted. He was the one that went before the king. But whenever he received his promotion, he said, hey, king, my three friends, my three friends, can you bless them too? Check. And the Lord promoted them as well. You ever been in a situation or had a relationship with somebody in your life where you gave them everything you had, you poured into them, you blessed them, you linked arms with them, and whenever they succeeded, they stood in their place of blessing, honor, glory, whatever. They didn't acknowledge you. They didn't give you any credit. They didn't thank you. They just used you as something to step on to get to where they needed to go or wanted to go. That is the way of the world. This is the way of the kingdom. A victory for one of them was a victory for all of them. The death sentence for one of them was the death sentence for all of them. And the promotion for one of them was a promotion for all of them. I can't sit anymore. We'll see about that. I'm looking at the time. Let's go to let's go to chapter three. Verse one. Daniel three verse one. Nebuchadnezzar the king caused to be made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits or 90 feet and its breadth 6 feet or 9 feet. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And there's a lot of syllables for you grammar nerds in the house with his name. I'm just going to call him the king and drop his name out. It'll save like probably five minutes of my message from here on out. So then the king sent to gather the satraps, deputies, governors, judges, chief stargazers, tra- treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, lawyers, chief officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had caused to be set up. <sighs> Got to take a, a breath after each one of these verses. Then the satraps, deputies, governors, judges, chief stargazers, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, lawyers, and chief officials of the provinces were gathered together for the dedication of the image that the king had set up. And they stood before the image that the king had set up. It says this a lot. There's an image that the king had set up. Then the herald cried aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages. That when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, dulcimer, bagpipe of every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that the king has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall that very hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Same king, same God complex, himself. Basically, he's built a um, giant statue of himself and wants everybody to worship. 
the statue that he set up. He's hired like worship teams to come and lead worship to his statue of himself that he set up. Hmm. What was in my heart to say in response to that was, it was basically like, kind of like what Satan does in the culture today with the worship team hiring aspect of like, you know, Grammy performances, Super Bowl performances. The Lord says in the moment, he says, has my church done the same thing? Has of my church hired worship teams, staff members, ministry leaders to draw attention to and put people in place to worship the image of themselves that they have set up? And it seems as though, it doesn't seem, it is, that the Lord is less concerned with our culture today and he's more concerned with his church. Verse seven, I'll let y'all turn there. Therefore, whenever all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, Lyre, trigon, dulcimer, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people's nations and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that the king had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain men of Chaldean descent came near and brought malicious accusations against the Jews. They said to the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, I just hate these kind of people. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, dulcimer, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews you have appointed to set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. Do not serve your gods or the golden image which you have set up. There's always a rat. Always a rat. Always. Hey, king, there are these people that you have promoted. Jealous much. There are these people that you have promoted, O king, and they are not obeying the decree. They're not worshiping the idol that you set up of yourself. Shouldn't you be murdering them about now? Basically what they said. Obviously some of this is like Danik's Dan version of the Bible. You hear like my internal dialogue. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men were brought before the king. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, said to them, it is, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, dulcimer, bagpipe, bagpipe, and every kind of music, fall down to the worship and worship the image which I have made. Very good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast at once into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God who can deliver you out of my hands? The king saying, I am God. You will worship me. The culture today is saying, I am God. You will worship me. But pay attention to their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 16, answer the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, it's not necessary for us to answer you on this point. 
If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. They said, King, we ain't going to serve your gods, and we ain't worshiping that idol you set up. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how shiny it is. We're not worshiping it. How do you think this made the king feel? Barbara says, angry. I could see that, yeah. His uh, track record precedes him. The king was full of fury, verse 19, and his facial expression was changed to antagonism against Shavrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he commanded that the furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it is usually heated. And he commanded the strongest men in his army to bind Shavrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which, pause, is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The Babylonians changed their names as well. And he commanded the strongest men in his army to bind Shavrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these three men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics or undergarments, their turbans, and their other clothing, and they were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was so urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame and sparks from the fire killed the men who had handled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the burning fiery furnace. So, you're right. The king was upset, Barbara, to say the least. Fire's turned up seven times harder than it normally is turned up, too. And the men that, that were tasked to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were throwing them in, as they're throwing them in, die because it's so hot. Verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king saw and was astounded. He jumped up and said to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, True, O king. And he answered, Behold, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of gods, son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out here and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the midst of the fire. Now remember the meaning of these three men's Hebrew names. If you can pull that back up, Josh. I don't know if you've got it available. Grace, mercy, gift of the Lord, who is like God, helped by God. The names that they were given, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were names after their false gods again. And I'm somebody that just, I don't know if it's just how I'm wired, but I believe that a name is a prophetic declarative statement. And so before we had our two kids, I prayed and I asked the Lord to show me, like, God, who have you called my kids to be in your kingdom? And based upon what the Lord told me is what I named my children. That way, every time any of you calls my children by their name or anyone else in the world calls my children by their name, they are required to agree with what the Lord's already spoken over their life. You're... Daily, as I, as I speak the name of my child, I am declaring what the Lord has called my son to be. I am declaring what the Lord has called my daughter to be in his kingdom. The enemy, King Nebuchadnezzar and his people and his culture in this time, one of the first things that they did was take away the names that they were given and give them different names, basically names after demons. Hmm. 
And I believe this story, I believe this story doesn't exist in the Bible only to reveal the glory of God and his power. Certainly that's the, the primary component of why the Lord would put this in this word. But I believe that the Lord has put this story in his word because it doesn't matter how hard the enemy tries to change your identity, to steal your name, your promises, your blessings, your freedoms. He can't change the calling and the anointing that you have on your life. The enemy tried to take that from Daniel. The enemy tried to take that from Meshach and Abednego. But when it came down to it, it didn't matter what the Babylonians called them. They were who God called them to be. There's always been a death sentence on the church of Jesus because sometimes the Lord just puts something in my mind to say, I'm like, Lord, you really want me to say that? That's not going to be controversial or anything. Okay. There is a hell. That is not a popular belief today, but it is the truth. Hell exists. And people that don't have a relationship with God, people that have not received Jesus as their Savior, that have not repented of their sins and given their life to Jesus, they're going to hell. And I think we as the church, we forget that a lot of times. The death sentence from the devil is always on the church because the, the real church is the people who recognize that the people that don't know Jesus, that have not surrendered their lives to Jesus, are the ones that are going to hell. And the church and the United States in the more recent years, that has not really been the, that's not been the focus of the church, that there are broken people that don't know Jesus that are going to hell. We focus a lot more on, what should I call them? ancillary items, peripherals, things that are less important. We focus on the less important things that, it's not that they have no value, but they do not have the ultimate value. And we exchange those things at the cost of people's souls, and at the cost of people's eternity. There is fire coming for God's church. There is fire coming for his church. Hmm. Lord says in his word that at the very end, everything will be tested through fire. The things that meant nothing will burn away, and the things that meant everything to him will remain. And I'm very paraphrasing, paraphrasing that statement, but that is what the Lord's saying in his word. The Lord's calling this house to be a church so that whenever the fire hits, we're not fully incinerated. The things that he doesn't have for us to exist do burn away. Please, Lord, take those things away. We all said that we want to, that we're receiving the freedom to see his kingdom happen in this house. So the things that don't matter, we want his fire to come. We want those things to burn away so that all that's left is what he has for us and what remains.
Verse 27. About to wrap up. And the satraps, the deputies, the governors, the king's counselors gathered around and saw these men that the fire had no power upon their bodies, nor was the hair on their head singed, neither their garments scorched or changed in color or condition. And they didn't even have the smell of smoke clung to them. Then the king said, Blessed be God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who believed in, trusted in, and relied on him. And they set aside the king's command and yielded their bodies rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Now, this is the de declaration from the evil king. Verse 29, he says, Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, and language that speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces, and their houses be made a dunghill. For there is no other God who can deliver in this way. And then what happened to them? Verse 30, it says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Church, your death sentence is your promotion. Your death sentence is your promotion. And we have to stop being so conflict diverse as God's people. We have to stop being conflict averse. I don't understand, and I'm preaching to myself, guys. Like, I don't have any of this mastered. The Lord just has me here, you know. In the Bible, the Lord spoke through donkeys. So I'm at least on the par with a donkey. So when I stand up here and I, and I give hard words to you guys, it's not because I'm perfect. Ask my wife. She can tell you all the ways I'm imperfect. There's a long list. But why are we so conflict averse? We are so conflict averse because we don't believe God is, is who he says that he is. That's why. If we, during the pandemic, everybody had to get vaxxed. If you didn't get vaxxed in a lot of situations, you lost your job. You lost your livelihood. You got doxxed. I worked for, at the time, I worked for the first health organization to mandate vaccines. And I'm not going to share my opinions on any of that. I'm just going to share the facts. And they doxed one of their physicians because their physician didn't believe that the vaccine was right for all of her patients. And so they threw her under the bus of media to try to end her career because she wanted to do what was right for her patients based upon what she believed. They said, no, you're bowing to what we say or we're gonna throw you in the fire. And I have no idea what happened beyond that for that woman, but those situations have already happened. And there will come a day, the word says, where the enemy will put the whole world in a situation where you're either going to take the mark of the beast, the mark of the devil, and you'll be able to live your same comfortable life or, if you don't, you won't be able to have anything. That day will come. The Bible says it. And that's not in, I don't have the scriptures up today. You go search for it yourself. And if it was, when we come to that point, if it's Jesus' church that existed in the, that there is no change or repentance and transformation in our lives, by the time that that comes to pass, there will be 
there won't just be a remnant. There will be like a really like thin, minimalistic, very, very small remnant of people that will remain. But decisions not to bow before false gods and, and idols or taking the mark of the beast or whatever it is, those are not made in the moment. The situation doesn't present itself to you right then and you say, hmm, what am I going to do in this situation? Being able to stand with that amount of strength and confidence before a king who's about to throw you into a fire and burn you alive they already know who their God is long before they came to that point in time. They knew that the Lord was going to get the glory whether they burned up in the fire or he were delivered them from it. And they didn't care which happened. They just knew that God's going to get the glory and they're going to give it to him by whatever measures it looks like. God says that he's in the fire with us. He says, don't be afraid of the fire. In both stories today of Daniel and Shagrat, Meshach, and Abednego, they both had a death sentence. The king had planned to kill both of them. He even tried, obviously, physically, tried to kill Sharag, Meshach, and Abednego. And I'm sure there were lots of other Israelites and people that could have been in these chapters in the Word. But the three that we see, the four that we see are Daniel, Shabrak, Meshach, and Abednego. Doesn't talk about any other Israelites or Jews that did not bow before the king's idol. The ones that stood out, the ones that the Lord credited were the ones that stood up for his name, for his righteousness. What if the Lord had allowed for them to burn up? What if he didn't come physically to be with them in the midst of the fire? Would their death have still been a promotion? Yes, it would have. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if I, if I am martyred, if I'm killed because of my, my faith and my love for Jesus, I'm, yeah, from this word, I'm, world, I'm gone. Where am I going? I'm going to a place where there's no tears, no sadness, no pain. I'm going somewhere where there is no breaks in time where the Lord's presence exists or doesn't. It will be forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. So why are we as the church afraid to go into the fire? Why are we afraid that we will be thrown in the fire? Either the Lord's going to be with us or he's going to be with us. It's a no-lose situation. He's always going to be with us. Man, I'm so off the page today, guys. Amen. Great. The Lord's, the Lord's, the Lord's giving me the freedom, too. Hmm. The Lord wants me to speak a, a blessing, a blessing over Gen Z today. So if you're Gen Z, that means if you're born like 1997 or 8 to 2012, 
if you want to receive the blessing that God has for your life today, I want you to come up here and just stand at the altar. And if old people, if you come up here and try to pretend like you're Gen Z, we're all going to know. I can't promise that anyone will not judge you because they probably will. Just kidding. And yep, folks in the booth, that y'all want to as well. And as I say this, there are people in the house that I thought were a lot younger that are older than I thought they were. The reason why I called Aliel up here is because the Lord told me as I was praying over this message this week that your generation will be a generation of fire and in the fire. Don't be afraid because whenever you start to think to myself, I'm in the fire, remember I, the I am is in the fire with you. Hmm. Gen Z, you are a fatherless generation. But I am your father, says the Lord. Your impact will be great on this earth. You will get no's from those in your life, but I will direct you to my yeses. I will put a measure of my spirit in you of boldness that the world has never seen. The older generations believe that they have had this measure of boldness. Mm -mm. But it's nothing like what I've placed inside of you. By your boldness, will you teach the previous generations where they lack in passion, where they lack in zeal, where they lack in compassion, where they lack in being all things to all people in order to win souls? You will be different than the previous living generations as you will not choose preference over presence. You will not choose preference over purpose. You will not choose preference over power and authority. Gen Z, you will open blind eyes, both physically and spiritually. The manifestations of my kingdom through your life will enlighten those who have believed that they have arrived. You will sow and invest differently than the generations before you. Where the previous generations have invested heavily in the natural and the physical, your generation will have a heavy investment in the supernatural and the spiritual. Unlike previous generations, you will not You will not bury my provisions in the dirt. You will not turn my provision into, you will turn my provision into investment and return. Your generation will not look to those around you and blame those in power for the problems that exist in the world, but you will see the problems with a glimmer in your eye as you will recognize that God has called you to solve these problems. As you sow solutions, you will reap my kingdom I'm giving you the wherewithal to accomplish the great and mighty works ahead of you. Your generation will be named, will be renamed to be the greatest of all generations. Because your generation will have known great spiritual hardship, great spiritual warfare, and the greatest spiritual prosperity that has ever been seen. Gen Z, your compassion is both your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Spirit of the Lord says to you, you must be careful that you show compassion, not that people remain captive, but when you see their captivity, you walk in your boldness to open the blind eyes and set people free. The Lord says to you, you are the church's mediators to the world. As previous generations of believers have been or are losing touch with the non-believers, the Lord says, you will reap the harvest. He says, but you will endure persecution. 
Many will ridicule your methods, your simple-mindedness. The Lord says, I will humble the wise before you. Many in your generation will be martyred for the power and authority that you carry from me. And the greatest persecution will come from those who do have preference over presence, who do have preference over power and authority and preference over purpose. The Spirit of the Lord says you cannot fit into their box. And he says, neither can I. He says, you must abide in me because at times there will be a thin line between preference and presence. And without abiding in me, you will be led astray. The Lord says, fear not because your martyrdom will be your promotion. Great is your reward in heaven, says the Lord. He says, fear not those who can take your physical life, but I who can take both your physical and spiritual life. He says, I'm in the fire with you. I am excited to adventure with you. He says, don't dishonor those that have come before you, but also do not adopt their preferences. He says, seek their wisdom, as this can be the pedestal for your successes, but do not allow their limitations to limit you. The Lord says, I'm in the fire with you. He says, do not be afraid. The harder it gets, the closer I am. The world will set you up for failure, but it cannot steal the success that I will pour out over you. The world cannot steal my kingdom from you. Be strong and courageous because I, the Lord God, am with you wherever you go. You are the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego generation. You will not bow to the kings of this world or their gods. You will be thrown into the fire, but I am in the fire, says the Lord. You'll be a generation that's addicted to the fire because of my presence. Mm. You're a generation that will be marked for your heart for the future of the kingdom of God, unlike those who pine for experiences in my kingdom from past seasons. Let's say the Lord, you are the end of what was in order to usher in the beginning of what is. And the Lord says, what is, is my kingdom. I've called you to prepare the way, Gen Z. Prepare the way for my kingdom. My kingdom is coming quickly. Will you prepare the way? I just want to pray a blessing over you guys. If y'all agree with that over, over this generation, I want y'all just to extend your hands towards this generation and let's bless them. Father God, we receive the word that you're speaking over this generation, God. We receive the word, God. We help us to see them with your eyes, God. Help us to see them. Hmm. Help us to see them as the fire generation, God. Hmm. Even as I say that. Hmm. And the end times that, and the word, Jesus is described as having eyes of fire. And the Lord says, I have eyes of fire because I see a generation on fire for me. Hmm. Lord, help us to have your eyes over Gen Z, God, and help us to see them through your eyes, Lord. Help us to not place limitations on them, God, not allow for them to be succumbed and bound by the limitations that we've had, God, as your people in the previous generations, Lord. Let us learn how to model God and how to partner with them to see freedom, God, to operate in your kingdom, God, not just in the four walls of the house, where we worship God, but outside of the walls. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint their tongues, God, as, they, as you put them before kings, as you put them before presidents, God. 
Mm. We thank you, Lord, that you're giving them that dogmatic spirit, God, one that's not going to be swayed to the right and to the left, Lord, that's going to toe the line, God, toe the line, the narrow path, God, of your kingdom, your callings on their life, Lord, to know why you've called them, what you've called them to, Hmm. and to see it come to fruition, not just to know it, but to walk it out and see it happen. Lord, we speak a blessing over this generation, God. We ask that you bless them financially, Lord. Bless them with an increase of power and authority, God. Bless them with an increase of their presence manifest in in their lives, God. Of your presence manifest in their lives. Mm. Mm. Let us not see this generation, God, as, as one that we have to compete with, Lord. But let us see them as the ones you've called for us to partner to for everything that the previous generations have prayed for, God. Everything that we've prayed for, God. The revival, God, that we've prayed for. The harvest that we've prayed for. Hmm. Hmm. Let us partner with them, God. Give us the wisdom, God. Allow for us to lay down preferences, God. Allow for us to lay down preferences, God, so that your presence can flow, so that there can be freedom that's, that is not just talked about, but it can be experienced, God, and carried. Hmm. just bless you, Gen Z. We bless you. We bless the hand of the Lord on your life. We, bre- we bless you into your anointing, your callings. We thank God for you. We thank God for, for your boldness that you carry. Hmm. I just ask the Lord that you would Allow for this generation, God, to operate in the prophetic, Lord. Allow for this generation to be a generation of dreams and visions, God. We ask for more, more of your spirit to be poured out over them. Hmm. The Refuge is located at 130 Gulf Freeway North in League City, Texas. Come join us Sundays at 1030 a.m. We value his presence and we value his people. Find out more at www.therefuge.live.